Good evening, good evening. I'm Lucinda Gabriel, and today we are October 9th, 2022. And welcome, welcome this week. Um, I have a, a really, I think, a very good message this week that the Lord put on my heart. And the word is, hasten the Lord's coming. Let Hasten his return. That's what it's about. And so, what does the word haste mean? It means excessive speed or urgency of movement or action or to hurry. So hurry along. And where do we find this in the word? Well, in Second Peter chapter 3, it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So, here we understand that we believers are looking forward to the day of the Lord's coming and we can actually hurry it along or speed it up so we can speed up his coming as some versions say so how can we haste the Lord's coming well we can find that answer in Matthew chapter 24 and um, it says verse 3 now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will all these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and at the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. We see all that happening right now. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. So that's what we, ex we can kind of expect that's coming. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many, and because of lawlessness will abound. The law of many will grow cold, but he who endures till the end shall be saved. This good news of the kingdom, meaning the gospel, will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end of the age will come. So here we see that the last thing preceding the Lord's coming it is that this good news of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony and then the end will come so therefore we can see that we can hasten the Lord's coming by sharing the good news with the whole world and the verse actually said this good news and there was a very good reason why it said this good news, because it implies that there would be other Gospels that would be preached. And today, we can clearly see, excuse me, we can clearly see that other Gospels are being preached, like the Prosperity Gospel, the Hyper Grace Gospel, and, um, and, but, you know, what's the difference between those Gospels and this Gospel, which Jesus was talking about? Well, it's actually the gospel of repentance so if you're going somewhere in a church and or anywhere if you're talking to anyone and they're not speaking about repentance run away from them if they're talking about all god can give you is love 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 and money 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 and there's no talk of repentance run away because the true gospel is the gospel of repentance jesus said in matthew 4 17 from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And in the book of Mark, we read in chapter 1, verse 15, that Jesus said, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. 
So see, Jesus preached repentance. Jesus did not tell people that he came to give them abundance in their lives. And we still see churches talking about this today, which is absolutely shocking. His exact were this. His exact words were John uh, chapter 10, verse 10. The thief comes not, uh, does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So have life more abundantly. So Jesus came to so we could have life more abundantly, not more abundance. And we read this a little further in chapter, in the same chapter, verse 28. It says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. So this abundance of life is eternal life. So you see, that's how abundant it is. It's eternal. But over 2,000 years have passed. And despite all the false and watered-down Gospels, this true Gospel of repentance is still being preached. And so rare, but it is being preached. And there is now a new generation of believers, praise God, that the Lord is waking up right now. And they are His true end times army. And they will not waver. They will not compromise the truth and they will not sell it either. They will preach the hard truth and they will live it until the end, until death. They are taking it to the ends of the earth because they know that when this gospel, this true gospel of repentance is preached, then the end will come. They are doing exactly what Jesus desired. They are hastening his coming. And they are like the first disciples we read about in the book of Acts. You know, last spring we did an amazing Bible study in the book of Acts. And we understood that within only 13 years, Paul, along with a team of disciples, uh, spread the gospel to the entire known world at that time. And it talks about, you know, like equivalent to up to 7, 8 million people in only 13 years. So keep in mind that they did not have internet. They did not have vehicles. They were on foot. They traveled by boat and camels. So to reach that many people in such a short time, it couldn't, you know, Paul could not have done it alone. Each person must have been a disciple and be a soul winner. So every person had to be sharing the good news for them to be able to, to cover so much ground in such little time. And do we see that in our churches today? Does your church go out to tell people about the good news or does it all or does all your congregation sit on the pews and pray for revival like most? This is what I've seen, you know. And waiting on God to make a move when he has already made his move. And he is waiting on us to do our part. Jesus said in Mark 16, 15, he said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So we were commanded to go, not commanded to stay and pray for revival. We were commanded to go out of the building. You see, this is the problem that has delayed the Lord's return. Apart from the fact that religion has made people way too comfortable in their lives, in fact, loving their lives more than Jesus. And I've seen this. I've heard singers, I could name them to you, but I won't. But I've heard uh, people, uh, famous singers in interviews saying, I don't want Jesus to come back yet. I, I'm, my life is too good right now. It's too good. I, I'm not, I don't want him to come yet. This is what I've heard. It's shocking. It's shocking. Many Christians don't want Jesus to come back because they love their lives too much. This is not what Jesus taught. Jesus said in Luke 14, So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. And in the book of Revelations, at the end, it says they loved not their lives unto death. And that's the way we're supposed to live. We're not supposed to love our lives. You know, it says to be content in your life. But there's nothing in this world to love. Because everything in this world doesn't come from God. You know, not to say that he doesn't give good gifts to his children. But a lot of the things that people think come from God are not from God. The gift of salvation is free. But because Jesus prayed, paid the price on the cross with his own blood. But there is a cost to follow him. And that costs us everything. Jesus wants it all. Not five minutes in the morning and a weekly Sunday service. And maybe a Wednesday night Bible. 
study. He wants it all. He wants everything. He wants it every day, every minute of every day. So he wants us to want him and he wants us to be a disciple who makes disciples. And some people say, oh, well, that's somebody else's calling, not mine. So are we all called to be evangelists? No, but we are all called to evangelize. Are we all called to be teachers? No, but we can all teach someone something. Are we all called to be prophets? No, but we should all be able to hear God's voice. Are we all called to be pastors? No, but we should all be able to care for someone. Are we all called to be apostles? No, but we all could open our homes and have home church. So in Acts 19, we read about how Paul went into the synagogues and then he taught in a school and all who dwelt in Asia, it says, heard the word of the Lord. And this represented seven or eight million people. So he could not have done it alone. It was not only the apostles that spread the good news, but every single disciple did. In Acts 19, we read that, And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. So this tells us that they, they were also performing miracles that glorified God. How much do you see of this today? Is your church teaching you that this is not for today? Because I know many churches are saying that, you know, that, oh, this was all past. It's not past. I've seen miracles myself today. And we should all be building our faith in these miracles. We're going to need it. We're going to need it for the times to come. In Romans 15, we read about how Paul traveled from Jerusalem to Illyricum, a distance of 1,600 kilometers. And because there is no more work here, he said, I have a great desire to come to you. And that was in Rome. So he traveled, Paul traveled another 4,000 kilometers to Rome. And in only 13 years, Paul and disciples preached the good news to the whole known world at that time. It's absolutely amazing. Astounding is what it is. How could they do this? Only by what we call today a multiplication movement, where each disciple makes disciples and each disciple becomes a soul winner. This is what they do in China. This is what they do in Iran. In these places where they're persecuted, they don't all have Bibles, but they're all, you know, disciple to be a soul winner. So why did Paul put so much effort to reach the end of the known world at that time? Well, Paul was hastening the Lord's return. Paul knew that when the gospel of this kingdom would be preached to all the earth, that Jesus would return. We know that the Americas were not discovered back then, so Paul could not have covered the old earth, but today we believe that we have mapped the old earth. And with technology and the internet, we can reach everyone in the most remote places. And I believe that we've probably done it, mm, yeah, it's probably pretty well done. Most people have a home computer or phone and so have access to a Bible. And with the growing number of disciples, we believe people out there will meet someone sharing the good news. And you know, the time is coming where I've been telling you this for the past about two years, maybe. There won't be any more internet. Not the way we know it today. Anything that is Christian will be censored. The Lord spoke to me about it. And actually, was it was three, four weeks ago, he told me persecution is coming. Censorship will happen. Well, this past week, I was persecuted by a pastor and my French video was not put up uh, I could not download it from YouTube from Facebook because it got censored in 75 countries it said and so I didn't say anything in there except for read out the Bible so there was no reason no good reason to censor my video we'll see how it goes tonight but uh, the English one is fine because it's on a different channel but just to say 
that things are changing like really, 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 really fast. And conservative people, people that believe in the Bible, are really going to be persecuted in the times to come. And so this is what the Lord warned me about. And already, you know, we're experiencing, experiencing it. So are there any other conditions that can hasten the Lord's coming? Well, we find an answer in Revelations 19, verse 7 and 8. It says, um, Let us be glad and rejoice and give God glory, for the marriage of the land has come, uh, and his wife has made herself ready. So the marriage cannot take place until his wife, the bride of Christ, has made herself ready. And we can conclude that the state of the church affects the coming of the Lord. The Lord cannot come for his bride until she has made herself ready. So how do we make ourselves ready as the bride of Christ? We read it in the next verse. It says, And to her it was granted to be arranged, arrayed excuse me, in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So we are to be arrayed in fine linen, which are the righteous acts of the saints. And so what are righteous acts? Well, they are in fact good deeds. In Hebrews 10, 24, it says, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And then Ephesians 2, 2 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So God prepared good works for us who are born again believers. So from the day that, that we become born again, God has already got a plan for us. He's already got works for us to step into these good deeds. And we need to be obedient when he calls us to do these do good deeds. And we can't say, well, oh no, that's, that's not for me, Lord. I don't want to do that. You know, no, he, we're called. We need to have a relationship with him. We need to be praying to him, say, Lord, what it is, what is it that you want me to do? What's my part in your kingdom, Lord, in your army? So everybody has a role to play to, to advance the Lord's kingdom. And things are clear in the Bible, you know. Everybody needs to go out and preach. Everybody needs to be a soul winner, uh, sharing the gospel and praying for healing and deliverance and these things, baptizing them, making disciples. We're all called to do that. Not just special people, but everyone. So, if we continue in where we started in Second Peter verse, no, chapter three, it says, "Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly life should you live, looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along? On that day, you will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames." But we are looking forward to the new heavens and a new earth he has promised, a world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. So remember, our Lord's patience gives us people, gives people time to be saved. That's why he's being patient, because he wants people to be saved. He's giving us believers time to help save the people. And he's giving them time to repent. And this is what our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom God gave him. Speaking of these things in all of his letters, some of his comments are hard to understand and those who are ignorant and unstable have twisted his letters to mean something quite different. Nothing has changed in the world, just as they do with other parts of scripture. And this will result in their destruction. So this is Peter writing this. You already know these things, dear friends, so be on guard. Then you will not be carried away by the errors of these wicked people and lose your own secure footing. So it's saying that you can actually lose your own secure footing. Rather, you must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. All glory to Him, both now and forever. Amen. So, how can we hasten His return? Well, by preaching this gospel of the kingdom, which is of repentance by preaching it to all the earth and as the bride of Christ preparing for the marriage of the Lamb by our righteous acts and by being found living in peace and being pure and blameless in His sight. So, if we can hasten His coming by sharing the good news, can we also conclude that we can delay His coming if we don't share the gospel? I think we might be able to. With all the suffering in the world, shouldn't we want the Lord to come back soon so all these people's suffering can end? 
The Apostle Paul seemed to understand this, and that is why he worked so hard to get the message of the good news to the ends of the earth, and we should be doing the same. We should be looking for ways to share the gospel with others around us in a loving and truthful way. In Romans 10.14 it says, But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? So we need to be telling them. Somebody needs to be sent, right? Do you know that less than 1% of Quebecers are born again? Less than 1%. That means that 99% will not see the kingdom of God. Like, I want that to sink in. 99% of Quebecers will not enter or see the kingdom of God because they're not born again. Because, you know, if, you, if you're a believer, you know that you have to be born again. And it is the same in many other parts of the world. And as believers, that should really concern us. You know, I found Jesus um, in my 40s. And I never heard of him in the way that I did when I read the New Testament for myself. I had never met a true born-again believer in my life. I had never heard the term before. And I certainly did not know what it meant. I never, ever heard it. God himself spoke to me and said, Cut off your nutmegs, read the New Testament. And he said it to me three times. Because... Like many people, I was hooked on Netflix and I was preoccupied in the world and I just, you know, I was lazy, can I say, and I was disobedient. But after three times, I, I had the fear of God come over me and, uh, and I started to, to read the New Testament and I was shocked. And so many people in the world have not heard of this, you know, being, term being born again, and especially in places where it's, where it's very Catholic, like Quebec, for example. And many people out there that attend regular church are deceived, but do not even know it. So not only are the Catholics deceived, but many churchgoers are deceived. They believe they are saved because they have said a sinner's prayer, but they are not saved. And I'm telling you right now, if you only said a sinner's prayer, you need to go and read the whole New Testament for yourself and see what it says about, how, about what you need to do to be saved. So you're not deceived. And I can't say it enough to read the New Testament for yourselves. And don't trust anyone with your salvation. Because eternity is a long, 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 long time to be wrong. And judgment Day is coming for everyone. And how will you feel when you see your family, if you're a believer, and if you see your family member, your neighbor, or your friend look at you and say, Why didn't you tell me the truth? Why didn't you insist? Because they will be going to hell. If they don't become born again. And so that should be um, a weight, a burden on your heart. And when I was writing this out, you know, today, the Lord put it on my heart, Ezekiel, again, the watchman, right? And it says, once again, a message came to me from the Lord. <laughs> it's exactly it. It came to me this morning from the Lord, son of man, give your people this message. When I bring an army against the country, the people of that land choose one of their own to be a watchman. And when the watchman sees the enemy coming, he sounds the alarm to warn them. Then if those who hear the alarm refuse to take action, it is their own fault if they die. They heard the alarm but ignored it. So the responsibility is theirs. But if they had listened to the warning, they could have saved their lives. But if the watchman sees the enemy coming and doesn't sound the alarm to warn the people, he is responsible for their captivity. They will die in their sins, but I will hold the watchman responsible for their deaths. And I did a video specifically on this um, passage in the Bible. I think I did two in a row because the, the Lord brought me back to it twice. Because they will die in their sins. And I will hold the watchman responsible for their death. So we have a responsibility as believers to be sharing this. We can't keep this to ourselves. And it goes on. Now, son of man, I am making you a watchman for the people of Israel. Therefore, listen to what I say and warn them for me. If I announce that some wicked people are sure to die and you fail to tell them to change their ways, then they will die in their sins and I will hold you responsible for their deaths. But if you warn them to repent and they don't repent, they will die in their sins, but you will have saved yourself. 
this is what God put on my heart this morning. So we have a responsibility as believers to tell people about their sin, to share the good news that Jesus paid their debt with his own blood on the cross and to warn people about the coming day of judgment that is around the corner and explain how to get right with God. So how do we get right with God? Well, if this is the first time you've heard this message, go and read in the book of Acts. It says Acts chapter 2 verse 38, And Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. So that's my message for today. I really pray that it, it uh, shook you because that's, that's my job uh, is to shake you up and uh, really, you know, encourage you, truth and love, to serve the Lord with all your heart, all your mind, to love and serve Him with all your heart, your mind, and your soul, your strength. And so this, this is what it's all about, you know. Uh, time is short, time is short. And like I said just now, my videos are starting to be censored and persecution is has arrived and um, and some people are not liking what I say and I knew where persecution would come from and I've spoken about this in the last weeks too it's been a month I've been repeating the same message that the Lord keeps giving me in a different way and so the time is short my friends and uh, I may not be here every Sunday to bring you a message um, you know, so I encourage you to read the New Testament for yourselves. Be careful who you're following. Follow Jesus. Don't follow man because if man is 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 going down the wrong path, and Jesus said that you know the door, the way, it's narrow, it's difficult, and few people find it. That should frighten you. It should put the fear of God in you because few people find it. And when everybody's going in the same direction. You got to ask yourself if you're really going in the same direction, in the right direction, if you're following them, okay? And you, so, you know, seek the truth while it may be found. And you know, God said that uh, my people perish for a lack of knowledge, and it's because they don't know Him. That's what He meant. They don't know Him. So make sure that you know God and not the God that you created in your own mind, like I did, and many people do and did. Uh, you know, with the, the new age and, and with, the, with, you know, religion. Make sure you read the Bible for yourselves and don't believe that what everybody else says. Go and read it. Ask the Holy Spirit. Ask God to show you things, you know, and He will reveal it to you. So that's my message for today and I pray that it blessed you and I pray that it inspired you and it shook you up to go out and speak this to other people. You have a responsibility. If you're a believer, you have a responsibility to share the good news with other people around you. You know, it shouldn't be that people are like me and that have never, never heard the good news of Jesus Christ, you know. Uh, it doesn't make sense. And I was, I was angry when I came to the Lord. And I realized the truth and I found the truth. I was angry with Christians. And I may sound that way still a bit because... I felt like they weren't doing their jobs. They weren't doing their jobs. They weren't out there telling people the truth. They weren't shaking people up, you know, in a loving way and sharing, I mean, the, the amazing thing, like Jesus died for us, you know, so we could have eternal life and we could be healed and we could be free and delivered. I mean, he's done so much. He's the biggest, best kept secret in the world. And the sad part is, it's not that the government is... Um, um, censoring us is that Christians themselves are not even sharing the hope they have in Jesus. They're not even speaking about it. They're keeping it to themselves, you know, hogging it to themselves and not out there sharing this amazing grace that we have through Jesus Christ. So that should burden you. That should burden you that 99% of Quebecers are going to hell. As simple as that. And, and that's just Quebec. That's not talking about other provinces. I pray, I really pray that when you go out, and even myself, when we go out this week, whether we go to the grocery store or to the uh, hardware store or the post office, wherever we go, we are Christ-like. And not only Christ-like, but we share Christ with everyone where we go. 
That's what I pray. I pray that a burden comes on your heart and God puts boldness in you, in all of us, me too, me too, to get out there and share the good news and the true gospel of repentance with everyone. So that's my message. So God bless you and I'll see you again next week, God willing. Good night.